Dicks. Hi, I'm Dave Liss, a DC-based consultant and journalist, your host for the series of podcasts, Wellness Musketeers, where we discuss a wide range of topics ranging from health and wellness to life lessons and history. Today on the show, I'm very excited to have Corbin Dooley. Corbin is a musician, songwriter, and producer who is, most of all, a formidable music lover. Outside the recording studio, Corbin is a music business entrepreneur, founder, and creative director of the Los Angeles, California-based music production company, Bikini Wax Records. With roots in Arkansas and Memphis, Corbin recently released an alternative country album called Western Trauma, where he collaborated with six-time Grammy Award-winning producer and mix engineer Vance Powell. Today, we will learn the inspiration behind Western Trauma and how his creative process has helped him heal through his traumatic experiences. We'll also discuss the stigma placed on mental health in men and hear some clips of his music. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Corbin Dooley. Uh, thank you, Dave. Really appreciate you having me here. So, Corbin, tell our listeners a bit about your, you and your life. Well, and thank you for that introduction. Uh, I have been lucky to have lived in a few places, but as, as you mentioned, I grew up in Arkansas and then was raised around the Memphis, Tennessee area. Um, I went to college in North Carolina and... Then my path led to some travel out of the country, um, overseas, and then always been focused around music. Uh, you know, growing up with lessons when I was young, piano and guitar and drums. So I found myself during my travels just really enjoying a lot of the different musical cultures. And that aspect of being able to live in a few different places and now to be able to be able to have music as not only something that I have as a creative and healing outlet, but is my business. I'm, I'm just very grateful every day because of that. Can you tell our listeners about some of the, your life experiences and the, the major trauma that you've had to, to live with and, and work to overcome? Uh, yeah, it's, um, you know, I always think that it, you know, everybody has trauma. And then it's about how you approach it. I say a lot to people around me, choose love. You know, you can choose a, a, a tactic, but when you have to face trauma, as anybody does, large or small, you'll recognize that some of the things that I, I, I try to do help uh, me. And, and that, that really started when um, I was 16 and my one of my first girlfriends um, was hit by a train and died very tragically. And um, coping with that by writing about it and journaling, um, and you know, an uncle taught me a song uh, was critical to that healing process of of that. So music was a was a factor in helping me to heal from that first, you know, very impactful piece of trauma of her death. Subsequent, my, my aunt, uh, my mom's youngest sister, um, when I was 30 years old and she was in her late 30s, she took her own life. And so finding myself dealing with that, again, I, I journaling, writing music, writing songs, um, was a really big way for me to cope uh, with that piece of trauma. Um, I... I was uh, in New York um, on 9-11, about a half a block from the World Trade Center, um, and was on the top of my building when the second plane went in. Um, it was just really frightening and horrifying. Um, and again, journaled, wrote songs. That was, you know, my go-to is journaling. I've experienced, you know, the Woolsey Fire in 2018 was really uh, evacuating my house here in California. Um, you know, middle of the night, couldn't see in front of my face. That was intensely traumatic. But again, wrote a lot about it. Some great songs emerged from that. Um, and I would say, you know, the, the big thing that I've written Western Trauma about, which you were talking about in the intro, that and a little bit of my first record, Affection, but uh, really Western Trauma has been written about the death of my mom, who took her own life in 2016 which was, you know, being a, you know, just multiple time suicide survivor, well, I just, 
I'm going to write a song. And so I, I tried to choose love. It's hard at times, for sure. Um, and facing the my own darkness about my own path made me realize that, that I wanted to choose love. And so I wrote about it, journaled about it, and then started to talk to people about my feelings. And that was, you know, it, it, it's different points in my life, but it, when I reflect back on the consistent path, it was, it was journaling. And then later in life, I was, I felt more confident about just talking about it. I wish I could tell myself that, you know, younger self, Dave, mm-hmm. like it, it's okay to talk about it, you know, but especially growing up in the South and as a man, you know, I was just taught to mm-hmm. not talk about it. Um, how, how did all these experiences affect you um, after they happened one by one collectively and as you live your life today. Yeah. I I really, I would say, reflect on the idea of life is uh, a constant um, aspect in finding the, the light in darkness. And and that I, I feel like is, is everybody's choice. No matter who you are as a human, you, you can choose that. Um, people choose darkness because they're affected dramatically by darkness, and and I have been as well. And there are times that and I error and and find myself really challenged and facing uh, all of the negative uh, emotions. Um, anger was something that you know, as when my mom died, I really had to ask myself, you know, what was the point of of my anger? And I really have come to the conclusion there just there is no point. So each time that I've learned, I would say, as I've gotten older, more wise to the idea of trying to be mindful and practice my, you know, (laughs) survival tactics, Um, it's it's big for me to write them down and talk about it. So, you know, to answer your question, it's, it's just so important to talk about this when you have trauma. I don't care who it is. It can be a stranger. It can be your best friend. It can be a parent. It can be, you know, a distant cousin. Everybody has somebody in their life that they could talk about it with. It's just we, especially as men, Dave, we're we're just counseled to be strong. And it's Mm -hmm. not, it's meant to be a, a sign of weakness if you communicate vulnerability. And I just, I think that's a, a stigma that I want to try to dismantle. Um, mm-hmm. And and talking about the trauma because they've shaped me to say, do I want to choose light or and love or do I want to choose darkness and hate? And I, mm-hmm. I want to choose to the light, uh, even in the midst of sometimes living in the darkness. Um, you know, my mom died in December of 2016, and so this time of year, you know, especially coming toward the close, it's t- it's tough, you know, to to think, and I just have to. Do another thing, and that's reframe it. What would my mom want? You know, and um, she would want me to choose love. Do you have angry moments or things like that? I think it's natural, and yes. Um, and you know, I've I've tried to understand um, how to step back from them when they happen, and you know, they they happen in the. You know the times I'm least expecting, and and you know, unfortunately, because I am lucky to you know work with such a, an amazing team, you know, sometimes those are the the people that that bear the brunt of you know when I have a down dark moment, they hear about it first, and so then I I might you know because anger is just you know it's just it's all a self internalized emotion anger, and so then it's like if I get angry at anybody. It's, well, I'm just angry at myself for something that I couldn't do, you know? And so it's, but it's a lot easier to say than it is to practice, especially when, you know, there's a lot of hate out there in the world these days. And so it's just, it's a constant, constant avenue for me. I don't call it a battle, but it's an avenue to choose love. And I I just really try to hold that mantra often. Um, But but yes, there are angry moments. (laughs) Is empathy a part of this, or how does that relate to the way you think and the way you approach yourself and others? Uh, a beautiful question. Um, 
Yes, empathy is a, is a critical aspect, I think, to being mindful um, and to understanding how and what my role is as a human on the planet. And I b- have believed and also counseled from an early age, it is one thing, and that is helping others. And then it's, what is your path to doing it? And I, I, I realize that music, I've been lucky in music in so many ways, and to be able to choose this as my path, well, now I, I, I can be able to then foster and help others by saying, here's what I can do to help you, and, and constantly be saying that to myself over and over and over. How can I be empathetic and understand somebody's situation and help them? And I, I try to do it every day with the people that I work with. I try to do it with my friends, my family. I, I feel like it's critical to do it. Well, my, uh, my girlfriend and life partner, Becky, laughs because um, I, I am that person. If the cricket comes into the house, I try to capture it and take it out of the house instead of killing it. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's just, I, I don't know. I, I think the choose love mantra for my life extends to a lot of different aspects, uh, including empathy. You know? That's a great mantra. <laughs> Thank you. I, I think pre- it's hard for us sometimes. Oh, isn't it though? I mean, I I, I know that w- you know we face it. Um, I mean, have you have you faced that that situation of of angry moments and healing? Yeah, I from- mean, I think we all have places and points in our life where there's something we can't understand, don't understand, don't know how to resolve, don't know who to talk to, don't know where to go. Um, some things, you know, you think, could I, could I have prevented something? Like, uh, I had a, a woman I worked with and loved really great family and her brother committed suicide. And, um, there are three sisters and their mother and father, the boy, and they each, they said the hardest thing was, why didn't we pick this up? Why didn't we know? Why couldn't we tell that he had this challenge and then we could... Why couldn't we have helped him? We felt a big sense of guilt. Yeah, and and it's you know that that really goes to the root of that. Com- that they were empathetic. They wanted to be mm-hmm. empathetic. It was the the lack of communication, and I think that's again, you know, um, just generally as a human race, women are thought of as you know more sensitive, more emotional, and better communicators. And um, men uh, just you know, I, I I hope to think that you know. If I could, you know, talk to my 18-year-old self, what I would say is be more mindful. And then I would ask myself, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, <laughs> saying it out loud. <laughs> so it's, uh, but it is, yes, it's, uh, it's, it's hard. It's also hard to be, you know, support somebody in that situation, Dave. Like, and it's amazing that you did, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, you just don't know how someone's feeling. I mean, that's a... Uh... When you when you look at that your experiences, what what have been the most challenging parts of these events for you to deal with? You know, over uh, over time, I realize what it is the the big challenge that that comes from this is learning that something that somebody said to me not long after you know each one of these traumatic occasions is that time will help you, <laughs> and it. It, it does, and it's just not easy to live. Um, mm-hmm. One of the the key things I, I think I have said over the last um, few weeks is I've, I've tried to distill a statement down that an author that I just adore said, and it's really about living in today, learning from yesterday, not trying to think too hard about tomorrow. <laughs> and um, it's... That is a really in coping with trauma and coping with depression and, and finding myself in, in these own moments of darkness. I find that the, the big cue for me is to return back to the, you know that idea that I can find healing in, in, a, in different ways. You know it's, it's there for me to find. I just I, I need to be able to look for it and that I think is the biggest thing that I, I've found some, you know, we all have challenges. So it's then coming back to how to find it. And, you know, 
I remember that uh, the big thing for me was having vulnerability. That was, you know, mm-hmm. just like a, a, a big thing. That um, sometimes when somebody says it's okay to do that, mm-hmm. I still turn away from it because. Do, do you mean being able to talk show? about it or communicate it because I feel weak and that I shouldn't yeah. do it because I've been programmed to think a certain way about being strong and determined and focused and all of these aspects and that, you know, if. I'm having a hard time finding courage that I that I can lean on the again now I understand them what the survival tactics are the things I try to communicate to other people that help me find the peace you know and that for me is that moment of right between sadness and happiness it's just peacefulness because you're always going to have both rich meaning in this context for me, at certain times, it was the will to want to live. Um, the will and the courage to say, I want to, to fight to, to live. When I, demons in my head and voices say things uh, you know, that are evil and terrible to me. And I have to tell myself not to pay attention. Mm-hmm. And to find the... Uh, again, I, I call it courage, but something it's, it's, uh, you know, I, I, I do it this way, but it's singing and it's in the diaphragm or it's, uh, the, the Buddha rubbing the belly. It's, it's the thing of intestinal fortitude, finding mm-hmm. the courage inside to believe in yourself that you can be better. And that is that pivot point. Because when you're down, it's hard to like realize, well, well you know, I, I can't even get to zero. How am I going to get to 50% where I'm feeling positive? Well, mm-hmm. that's, you know, the survival tactics or, you know, again, that, that I say over and over and over to myself now that I understand what it is. Because I've just tried to work on myself and understand how I can reach those, again, that place, that peaceful place. How have your music and your creativity helped you kind of work through these things and express them? Deeper connection to the trauma is very hard to do. As an artist, it is something that is critical to the art. And that's just allowed me to, I I can, you know, if I'm vulnerable, then I can live in it. And living in the the dark place is, is okay for a time. Okay, so again, my girlfriend Becky, she would say, you know, it's okay if you want to visit the dark place. Just please don't go set up, you know, a house there. And so I, you know, that's, you know, a, a big thing for me is is that. And you know, when it comes to music, over the years, what I have found is that I, I do and can write and and enjoy journaling um, personally, reflecting alone. So I, I can be comfortable alone. Once my idea, I realize once it, it's in my head that it wants to become a song. That next step, I really like to, you know, collaborate with other people. It, it's mm-hmm. just that that process is so fills me with with serotonin, and so I, over the years, and you know, luckily now I am just surrounded by. You know, a great core team of people who are amazing, as you have experienced, Dave, who are so, yeah. you know, not only talented, but just empathetic and precise. And, you know, they live their lives with kindness. And they're also just so creative. It's just watching those escalations and the way that they flourish, those things and that music part of it, oh my gosh, that can help um, fight those you know the dark demons in a in a big way and i've just done it my entire life i I don't really think i've been able to understand what it was and say that statement though until Mm -hmm. you know the last few years um of just trying to understand like what i need to do what are the lessons that you've learned as a man and and the things that you would want other men dealing with overcoming trauma and traumatic experiences to learn and to kind of embrace in their lives. Yeah. 
well, that's, uh, I, I say it a lot, but it's, you know, communication. And, and don't be afraid to talk about it. If, if you're uncomfortable talking to somebody who's close to you in your life, have a random conversation with somebody. You can uh, talk to somebody in your life who's spiritual. If, if you want to talk to your yoga instructor or your pastor, or if you want to talk to a friend or a cousin, or if you want to talk to a total stranger on the telephone, I just encourage it's okay to communicate. That's the biggest thing as a man. It's, it, it's actually wonderful to be vulnerable and communicate because then once you've actually said the words out loud that, hey, I'm feeling sad, um, I'm not really sure why, but this is what's happened to me. Maybe somebody on the other end is saying, yeah, I, I know what that's like and here's what's happened to me. And all of a sudden you're like, wow, I don't feel alone. And maybe I don't even feel as sad as much. Maybe my sadness is, you know, I, I'm gone more toward the happiness place. What are, what are the steps that men can work towards talking about their feelings, expressing their emotions, and, and communicating their feelings? How do you get A to B? I guess I am hard on myself. I've been told that. Um, and I I realize that it's just something that, you know, letting things go is, is tough. It's a lot easier said uh, than done. But letting go of, uh, you know, some of those very intense moments when you're thinking about them and not being judgmental of the way that you feel when you're analyzing them in your head because you're thinking about them. Another big thing besides letting go for me is is reading about somebody else who's had a, you know a, a path that has been successful. And you know that for me is has been something that's allowed me to get to the next place, you know, which is journaling. Cause then if I read, then I can, you know, emulate and say, okay, well, you know, this author that I really adore, wow, he's, he's had some of these same thoughts that I've had. So I don't feel alone, you know, and somebody else has written about him. Um, and, you know, I've, I've said it, it, I do say it, but journaling, I just feel like is very critical and, you know, whatever you want to call it, it you know, it was um, my mom early on said, you can call it a journal, it's a diary, Corbin, whatever, you know, but it seemed like all of my, you know, women, you know, and girlfriends, I always heard everybody, all, all the women had a diary. Okay. And so they got to memorialize all their thoughts, but why weren't the men encouraged to memorialize all their thoughts? Well, my mom, to her credit, said, like, well, hey, just have this you know, spiral notebook and here's a pencil and this is your journal. I'm like, what? And she's like, well, just write down how you're thinking. What, what are you feeling? You know? And she was the one who got me to start it. And you know, that, wow. that for me to this day has been a, a big thing. And I just, again, you know, I, I go back to the piece of communication and reading about it. And, uh, you know, I, I know we've said it a lot, but trying to be mindful and that you know is the you know the four agreements, and I you know I, it's hard to you know live by those words. But um, Don Miguel Ruiz, who I just again amazing author, who I reference, uh, wrote the four agreements, and it's such a it's a very easy thing to say. It is so hard to live these, mm -hmm. and being impeccable with your word, always doing your best not taking anything personally and not making assumptions. I mean, my goodness, like oh, I, I, you know, and I make those mistakes every day. And so then when I find myself reflecting, I try to say, well, don't be judgmental, Corbin. You have right now and you have you know, that moment to say, okay, well, I'm going to just do my best and not make any assumptions and try not to take it personally when somebody says something that's mean. You know, mm -hmm. And then I can communicate about it, and that for me says, okay, well, I'm I'm trying to be impeccable with my word, so I'm mm -hmm. honoring. I try to honor the four agreements in life, and then I've carried it over into you know my my creative life, and then I try to carry it into my you know my business life because I, I do feel like that it is a path that can be followed. That again, it's it's very easy to say. Not so easy to do, right? <laughs> well, yeah, it's, I think uh, what's that? The hardest thing is to start, and and as you're 
thinking about that. Like, what are the most elementary basic steps that someone can take to just start this this process, this path? Yeah, you know, it's that idea of uh, the barrier to entry for a pencil and a piece of paper is very low. M- you know, <laughs> most most people can access that. And, 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 and that for me is, you know, it's, so it's very relatable that you can most anywhere around the world find yourself with a pencil and piece of paper to write down how you're feeling. And that can be private and you can keep it to yourself. You can keep it in your pocket. It doesn't matter the size of the paper. And Mm -hmm. that to me is a big part of what I consider journaling or memorializing my feelings. You know, the advent these days of of technology is a you know put a computer into everybody's hand with their phone and so it's so easy to hit a big red button on your phone and record your thoughts mm-hmm. and in, in, you know and so the, the barrier to entry pretty low um to be you, you do you do require that cell phone that has a, a big red button but most of these days a lot of people have cell phones and and they have uh, an app a voice memos app that they can hit that red button and record their thoughts and those are very concrete steps you can write it down or you can just say i'm you know i don't feel good you know into your phone right there and and then maybe you reflect on it a day later and you're thinking hmm do i feel the same and mm-hmm. and then that can help you to understand maybe your next path if it's writing it down because that might be the way that you find your next, you know, your next survival tactic. It's it's not a novel. It's just a thought. Yeah, because it doesn't need to be, in my opinion, uh, something that's verbose. It could be literally you write down a cue for yourself. Like I'm feeling sad um, because I, you know, something something occurred because my mom died. You know, and it could be Mm -hmm. simple as that. And I'm, I'm thinking about my mom and where she is now. And that's a simple statement. You put it in your pocket or, you know, I, for me, I close my journal and then a couple of days later I might go back to it and then put something underneath it, you know, about the, that same type of feeling. And I found that's really been helpful for me to write it down. I I work with that. I I try and do that myself. Ah, fantastic. Right on. Well, when, how how did the the practice come into your life? Did did somebody um, encourage you? I uh, I've read different things uh, over time about just like you said exactly the importance of journaling, the importance of acknowledging maybe it's a success in your life or on a regular basis, or maybe it's a, a struggle that you're dealing with. But like you said, exactly that expressing these thoughts help you release the thoughts or work through them in some way. Not necessarily resolve them immediately, but there's a place for it. You're kind of putting things out in the world and releasing them from your head. Very well said, Dave. Very well said. As you think about all of this, what, what are the most important survival tips you would want to share with others? Journaling. (laughs) <laughs> We're going to keep on that one. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, communication, you know, that we've, uh, you know, telling somebody, a friend, a family member, a stranger, somebody in your life about your thoughts and feelings at the moment. Um, yoga has been in my life for about, well, coming on 20 years now. And wow. um, and I, it's just, I my, my mom was a big proponent of what she just called stretching. You know, I do gentle yoga, um, you know, I, I do it, I practice, um, you know, by myself at home, uh, and occasionally I, I, you know, I had a, a, a yoga teacher who I still have in my life who I talk to regularly who helps guide a lot of my practices when I feel unaligned, and she's so amazing, so it's, um, it's nice to be able to... Um, know that that practice I think is has become a really critical part of my healing path daily and yoga for a lot of people and for me has led to meditation you know mm-hmm. the, the practice of yoga in itself is meditative I find and my 
yoga teacher's husband was the first person who really encouraged me. And he is a, an amazing meditative coach and encouraged me again, to, you know, it, it, nothing is wrong or right. It's just about mm -hmm. you doing it on your own or you could do it when you're walking or sitting in an airport. You know, we've talked about music creation is something that I, I feel very, that was, it felt like my calling from an early age. Mm -hmm. And these days with technology, um, you know, you can use your phone to be a musician, <laughs> which is amazing. Yeah. And so yeah. the, the barrier to entry for software and hardware is just so low. And I, I love that technology has broadened uh, music creation and allowed it to occur in so many mm -hmm. different environments. So I, I find that to be, you know, an amazing thing for me as well. I am a believer in cannabis and the very mindful use of the plant. And again, I journal about when I consume at the end of the day and how I consume. These days with beautiful regulation and you can understand what you're putting into your body and that is critical for me. Is it to help you think or relax? Um, mood or? stabilization is, um, uh -huh. you know, finding so that, you know, you don't go too high and you don't go too low and you can find a nice even path. And that for me is, again, I'm just very mindful about everything that I put in my body and I've, I've become very mindful now that, that cannabis is becoming more normalized. There are more choices for understanding continuous cycles of the plant because mm -hmm. that is one of the deterrents these days of the plant, which is that cultivation has not gotten to the place where it is consistent. It, is, it, it will be there. And, and I'm looking forward to, to those days when it normalizes so that it can be prescribed just like a pharmaceutical drug. I believe that, you know, there's a reason that God put that plant on, on the earth. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I have a, a friend and her sister had um, really dramatic and unpredictable uh, mood swings. Uh, and that for the first time in her life that through cannabis, she was able to reach a point of stability for her life and her family. Wow. I love hearing that. I love the stories about all of the incredible research that's been done with epilepsy and, you know, and yeah. CBD from the plant and, you know, the hemp from the plant. It's not just the, you know, the psychoactive, you know, aspects of the plant that are beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's just, I, I find there's a reason for it. And um, I'm a proponent of it as um, a choice. So it, it's been part of my healing journey. I think I alluded to it early. I like to read both, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as another survival tactic, both fiction and nonfiction. Mm -hmm. I find them, you know, authors to be, the ones that I gravitate to are authors that I would consider lyrical uh -huh. uh, in however they choose to write. And so I, um, and I've recently been reading uh, James Lee Burke, who uh, huh. is a fiction writer he is 89 years old. He's just written his 40th novel. And he is well known. What's beautiful and amazing about him is he's had this career of just incredible highs and lows. And he mm -hmm. wrote a book recently called A Private Cathedral. Mm -hmm. And that book, Dave, it really explores the idea about living in today, not in yesterday and not for tomorrow. And so I, I really just, I, I find reading to be something that allows me to escape, but also into my own world so that I can let my brain think. And it, it also then allows my brain to might be distracted from trauma. So it's a, it's a survival tactic that I, I like. Um, I like to take long drives. Um, that's something I've, I've done for a while, even uh, as a teenager, you know, in my non-fancy car. Um, and it, it doesn't depend on having a fancy car. For me, it's just about the idea of, of rolling the window down, uh, regardless of if it's really hot or really cold. And um, not even really having uh, music necessarily, but just mm -hmm. allowing all of the sounds of the world to, to filter in. And then you realize wow, there's a lot happening. And that for me becomes distracting and allows me to be out of the moment of thinking about trauma. 
And, you know, I think there's always solutions. You know, these days it's amazing to be able to have a ride share and do the same thing. <laughs> I know uh, another survival tactic I talk a lot about uh, with my friends is exercise. I exercised a lot uh, younger and I, I continue to try to do it. Yoga is a part of the routine. I, I tend to now walk a lot. Um, you know, it's, it's something that you can do anywhere. I, I do like to hike when the environment allows that. I, I do like to, I have a bicycle. I like to bike occasionally. And then uh, we talked about, you know, uh, this before, but diet and, and, you know, what is a balanced diet? And for me, diet, you know, started with basically, you know, being a meat and potatoes eater in the South growing up. That was just <laughs> part of our diet. And that is what it was. And, and then in my thirties, I was introduced and somebody talked to me about, you know, being a vegetarian. And I really, I adopted that for quite a long time. And then in my forties, I, be, I became a vegan and I really enjoyed it. The thing that I started to notice, and it's it's definitely changing now, was that going to, f I, I, I love food, and my mom loved to cook, and both my grandparents loved to cook, and I really like to cook too, so I, I guess I'm a little bit of a foodie. And so mm -hmm. the, the plating experience and having the experience of fine, what is called fine dining these days, of, yeah. of a beautiful plate with a gorgeous, dish with a, some negative space around it. Oh, I just, I love to, to do that myself. And, and then I love to go to places to do that. And yeah. there haven't been a lot of those nicer vegan restaurants and, and you know, there, there are more and more these days. So mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, you know, my dad calls me the cheating or the Cheegan. You know, you, uh -huh. you go That's out, you, you go out to the restaurant Corbin and then you have a little bit of bite of Becky's, you know, Filet, mm -hmm. or you know, and and, and Dave, I, I can do it occasionally, you know. So I don't yeah. limit myself. It's just about moderation. There's a place called Sunflower near where I live in Virginia, but I, I had a guy who owned a restaurant. He told me that he thought that sixty to seventy percent of food was how it looked on the plate, as opposed to how it tasted. It's a and big part of it. Made, made you think of that. It's a huge. I think it's a huge thing for me because if it doesn't look really pretty, I don't. I mean. I want food to be, ex, you know, as part of my survival tactic, not just, I don't want it to be a chore. I want it to be something I look forward to, you know? There should be some pleasure in it. I would like that to be, you know, be my my scenario, that's for sure. So. <laughs> it should not be a miserable experience for, uh, for all your all your food. Um, are, are there misconceptions that, about how most men or all people consider and deal with the trauma that they have in their lives? Yeah, um, you know, you can be vulnerable. It's mm -hmm. beautiful. You're not weak. It, 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 you're just you're just not you 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 know that that's I want to destigmatize that men can be emotional and that does not have to be considered weak. That that for me is like and I think there's a big strength in vulnerability, truthfully. And it's, you know, for me, I, the, the path that I've chosen to foster in more men that I know, you know, uh, younger than me and older. It is interesting that, you know, my, I've noticed that especially in the last, you know, 25 years, my father has gotten very in touch with his feminine side. He will say it out loud. <laughs> and he feels very sensitive and he can talk about things and it's amazing for me to see, um, and, and wonderful and beautiful, you know, and lucky yeah. because it, then it can show me that it's okay. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And you can have a better relationship with your father and that's really important. Oh, it was it, critical because, you know, especially after the death of my mom, it was, you know, it was hard on him too, because they'd been together for a long time and his wow. healing path was different than mine. And, and mm -hmm. there's, you know, you, you know, I'm not. I'm not judgmental about any of those uh, those paths, uh, um, but it's. I, I did notice that it, it. It's been a beautiful kind of reconciliation with my dad and I because he's able to really support when I um, want to be emotional about my mom. Mm -hmm. You know, so, is he doing well himself? 
He is, yeah. Thank you for asking. I appreciate it. He's um, he moved, and I, I think what he did is he noticed that you know his upbringing, his career path, his choices in life, his values, all were very beautiful and positive. They were all just very different than mine, and so. Mm-hmm. I wanted to honor his path and the choices that he made for his healing and continues to this day. And um, he's been so supportive and honoring mine, you know, and he even, Dave, you'll, I, I know that you'll appreciate this because, um, but my dad earlier this year came into the studio and sang on a song with me. Really? It was such a moment. I mean, encouraged by Dawn, just so amazingly by Dawn and, um, and recorded. It, is, um, it was just so he, awesome. <laughs> so, had he sang before? Has he sang? Is that part never, of his life? Never. Yep. Never. I mean, you know, maybe as a hobby, you know, on the radio or in the, you know, in the shower, but never, you know, around me. Um, and so it was just such a, it was a blessing. A really. And for blessing. our listeners who may not have had the, the pleasure, who, who is Dawn? Uh, so Don Jordan, also Don Potter, also Dior, uh, is an amazing uh, vocalist, songwriter, and producer who also ha- happens to be the operations manager working with Bikini Wax oh. uh, and uh, and me. So it's just she's been uh, so so pivotal in encouraging a lot of not only creative avenues and. Um, my life, but also um, a, a great business, you know, mm-hmm. acumen, um, because she's an entrepreneur herself. So uh, she saw the moment when my dad came to visit the studio of him mm-hmm. um, being there and how he lit up, but she was really encouraging and just, she just was very persistent and uh, allowing him to, f- to feel that it was going to be fine and that we would make mm-hmm. him sound good. And he, he uh, was, the encouragement is what he needed uh, to come in there. Because I, I, he wanted, I know that experience with me. I think he was probably, maybe, uh, uh, he didn't want to get in the way, if that makes sense. Hey. So, so that's um, a beautiful thing. Yeah. It was a, it was a. These are moments that you want before people get to a place in their life where oh, neither of you can appreciate it. Oh my goodness. Yes. I mean, um, core memories, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, as you kind of look at your life, you know, how did music become a part of your life and stay in your life? I mean, I know lots of people that used to play the piano. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was lucky to have those lessons, uh, you know, piano lessons first from you know, my mom played piano. Um, my grandfather played uh, jazz drums. And so th- those were big influences um, in my life for sure. Um, and then, you know, my mom encouraged the piano lessons, which I took, uh, and then guitar lessons and then drum lessons. Um, and it was so it was nice to have and start those skill sets uh, at a young age. You know, I had some uh, playing around, I would call it uh, experiences uh, with music in high school pickup projects, you know, whatever they were called, playing in garages, uh, playing in... Uh, you know, whatever, I I don't know if I would call it a band, uh, you know, at that point, but it was some uh, people getting together and trying to play instruments together. That was, uh, that was fun. Um, My pivot, I had a pivotal moment in college um, where I was on college radio. And Mm -hmm. uh, so I just, you know, became a DJ in college radio and spinning that you know led to me understanding turntables and spinning vinyl and what a you know a mic a DJ mixer was and mm-hmm. then what being on air meant and then understanding what the FCC was so college radio led to a lot of the understanding of the creative and the business side of of music um, and then that skill set of of college of learning to DJ and beat match and key match was critical to kind of understanding, okay, that's another skill set, just like, you know, piano or guitar or drums are. You know, turntable can be an instrument uh, combined with a mixer. And so it's just, it's incredible to see that that has really escalated over the last, you know, especially I would say 15 years. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I, I think because my parents were both very type A and strong-willed, 
I had entrepreneurial spirit. And um, so I, I leaned in on, for me, after learning from others on the idea that I wanted to be an entrepreneur in music. And so mm-hmm. I've chosen a few different paths that I wanted to say, hey, well, what will this be like? Has it always been that music has really, music has shaped its life around you and you've shaped your life around music kind of thing? Yeah, and using it for healing constantly and allowing it for, you know, you know whatever it was, the, the creative side, the, you know, the technical side, the, you know, the legal side, the um, financial side. I, I feel like I've, I've been able to learn a lot of the different aspects of the business mm-hmm. of the you know the business of music and mm-hmm. that led me to the idea of, of always circling back to well I was an artist when I was six and wanting to play music that wasn't you know in the tab <laughs> and my uh-huh. mom really didn't like that <laughs> so play what's on the page Corbin and I would always find myself riffing off of it because I found that to be more fun because my brain uh-huh. was inventing and it's same with the guitar same with the drums I you know I I enjoyed learning the basics but as soon as I learned the basics I just wanted to make my own and that for me was the the big piece of how you know, music just constantly was a creative force, uh, as you said, in my life, shaping my life. And with overcoming trauma, was there what blended in with that as well? Yeah, just the the constant idea of writing about it, of of journaling first, and then writing from that journal but the song that mm-hmm. then would be about. Uh, my aunt's death or about my mom's death or about the Woolsey fire or about 9-11 or about my first girlfriend's death. You know, it, it, whatever the trauma was, and those are the, the significant ones, I would just lean in to writing a song and then and, and manifesting with others to help get to the place where then I could realize that the healing path was the production of the song. And the completion of the song, because then I felt catharsis. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a vehicle. It's yeah, a- exactly. And you know, I you know, for me, it's it's just that I keep going back to that idea of you know the the trauma um, breeds fear, mm-hmm. and and hmm. you know it's natural that it does that. And so then it's for me then just about how I can overcome the fear. And that is, you know, music has allowed me to overcome fear often. And I just, you know, again, the, 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 in music, I, I believe in collaboration. Um, mm-hmm. I, and, and that for me is, is the support system that I look to for help uh, and, and uh, nurturing because it can be re- very reciprocal. What do you want listeners to take away from any of the song or the, or from the album? Are there, there feelings that you want the listener to take with them? Is there, is there a message that you want them to have from the album as a whole or from some of the particular song? Well, quickly summed up by saying, there will be darkness and you can choose love and find light. Uh. That, for me, is the quick way to say that trauma and sadness, you know, they're going to be around and, and they're going to enter your life every day. And then I ask myself, well, then finding myself, how, how do I find, you know, the peacefulness? And I, I keep returning to, you know, that for me, Dave, is is the critical piece. And I, I just ask myself, finding peacefulness is sadness can coexist with happiness. And in the Western trauma record, there is a lot of darkness and there's a lot of personal story of coping with trauma. Finding peacefulness is is something that can be achieved. 
And, mm -hmm. and that for me is the message that I hope can resonate in, in the songs. That's beautiful. Um, Thank you. What, what songs that you've written or songs that you listen to best express the trauma that you've experienced and the life that you have made in overcoming these these circumstances, these events. Yeah. Or, when you get to that dark place, what do you listen to to lift yourself up? Uh, well, uh, the first part of that is um, I wrote a song called Suicide Survivors Club. And that literally is about me saying back to myself, listening to that song that I wrote, that has been recorded, that has been released. When I'm feeling down, I'm a survivor. And I've, I've been, and you know, the, some of the lyrics, keep your courage up. You know, that, that for me is just like a big thing that I can say back to myself repeatedly. Our dreams, mirrors to the soul. New paradigm, suicide survivors club. Suicide survivors club. There is an, a song that I learned after my first girlfriend died and I was 16 and my uncle taught me the song Last Kiss and it was written uh, in the late 50s by Wayne Cochran um, about a, a tragic car accident and so I learned the song Last Kiss on the guitar and then on my first record Affection I did a cover of it and, and put it uh, on, on the album because it's, it's such an important song to me, to, again, to not only play the original, and there have been a few covers over the years of that song, but my own cover of it, it's kind of dark, and for me it really fits the theme. It, it really just resonates for me so that I can go back and listen to my own song and say, okay, well, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I can reflect on the memory and try to find peacefulness in that sad moment is, is what Last Kiss is for me. Also from the Western Trauma record, I, I wrote a song called See the Light. This one, because it's you know, so critical to me with a friend, um, you know, uh, Luke John is his name, an amazing singer, songwriter, producer in his own right. He uh, you know, was critical in being there to help me frame the idea of there's a lot of darkness, but how can we see the light? And literally not yeah. only um, say those words out loud, but even in the dark depths, can you see the light? And that's where, you know, the lyric went. And I was like, wow, okay, well, that is what I want to say. So I'm going to say that. Uh, and then pay attention to myself when I'm having a dark moment and listen huh. to see the light. With you by my side, I see the light. Also, and the final, you know, the, the first song on the Western Trauma record is Suicide Survivors Club. I feel like that sets the pace and tells the story of hope and getting past trauma with that first song. The 13th song on the record is a song called Survival Tactics. Yeah. And I wrote that song with Barbara Shuko. And um, she's an amazing multi-instrumentalist, singer, songwriter, producer from Brazil. And she was critical in helping me formulate and bringing the lightness to the survival tactics. Because I, I, I think I had understood that I wanted to be able to complete the record with a moment of saying, here is some light 
air of survival. And we are all yeah. going to survive together. And the song is, is for me, the, the song with the most light. And so it concludes the record. So as an album experience, starting from Suicide Survivors Club and ending with the sur- song Survival Tactics, for me, I am able to lean on survival tactics and say, I need to pay attention. What are my survival tactics? That's what I ask myself, Dave, when I'm having the dark moment. Is that kind of the message from the... It is. Al- of, of, of the, There are survival tactics. You know, you and I have talked about them uh, specifically. Each person has their own survival tactics. I'm trying to say, you can find your own. That's what I... Le- the, the record ends with, you can find your own survival tactics. Like I need slow wind Survival tactics You, you, you Find your own You, survival tactics That's great. I mean, it's, it's that brings everything together. Huh. How did you end up in L.A.? I, growing up in the South, uh, one of the things that my parents always encouraged was me to read. And so I read about different places. And then I, um, one of the TV shows I loved growing up was Johnny Quest. And he always had these great adventures. He traveled all over the world. So as soon as I could save up some money to go out of the country, I did. And being able to have lived in a few different places around the world um, and in the U.S., I really found that the environment that was the most conducive for me, because of the weather, that's a, that's a factor, because of the proximity to other creatives and for the proximity to other people in my life, L.A. has become the place that, while I've lived some other places it really feels like the place that is home for me and that will be the place that I live the rest of my years. Hmm. It's a, a great combination of those things. And it's also a, you know, aspect of living around to some other places that I realize I don't want to grow old in those places, you know, yeah. and the pace in Los Angeles, while it is active, maybe it's not as intense as some of the other creative hubs in the world. How have all your experiences impacted the choices you make in the, the artists that you select to produce as part of Bikini Wipes Records? Uh, I, I would say that uh, you know some of the you know the biggest pieces for me related to the people that I like to work with are their mindfulness at, at whatever age, and, and you know that's depending on where what stage they are and you know where they are in their life. Kindness is a huge thing for me. Empathy is another huge thing for me. And, you know, there are, in Los Angeles, and, and, uh, you know, these days you're connected with people so easily with technology. Talented, they're they're talented people, you know, they're all over. I mean, I, I feel very lucky to collaborate with people literally all over the world. And it's the factors, though, of kindness and empathy Honestly, it's more important to me than talent. Mm-hmm. You you can find talented people and you will see that those talented people, maybe what they need is just a little guidance to to um, blossom and, and to grow and then become the, the person that they were supposed to be. That to me is just a beautiful thing when I'm able to find somebody to work with and I realize that I've made a helpful impact in their life to help grow their artistic career it's the, I've helped them, which was, you know, what, I, what I'm here for. <laughs> so. That's great. That's, that's praise Zen. Thank you. <laughs> what does Western Trauma, your recently released album, what does it mean to you as an artist? Telling my truth in, in a statement. When you listen to the Western Trauma instrumentals, Dave, completely mm-hmm. different experience. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. it has been it has been reflected on to me uh, so many people recently since the Western Trauma Instrumentals record came out how personal 
the Western trauma record is. And, and that to me is I'm, I was able to tell my own truth. And that is exactly what I think, you know, was the purpose of the record was allowing me to let go, to heal and hope to have that message that, Hey, maybe it can help you as well. That's what I really, you know, wanted to come to over and over and over was how, if I'm going to release the record, how can it help other people? If it can help somebody to not feel alone when they're thinking dark thoughts, that's a huge <laughs> blessing. It really is. So we, we talked a bit about journaling and the, the importance of that. And I understand that, that this album, Western Trauma, reflects a lot about journal entries about your life and about the trauma and circumstances you experience. And could you talk about the work from writing to making music and what that felt like for you as a as a man, as a person to to kind of translate those feelings into art? Yeah, the you know the the biggest piece and this is you know it's surrounding I surrounded myself with people that I trusted. And realized that then I could communicate the emotion and they were not going to be judgmental. I don't think anybody should ever be judgmental, but if, at least when you know somebody and you have trust in that person, you're going to think they're not going to be judgmental of, of you. If you, uh, I mean, there were plenty of times during the make of this record, I just was crying, you know, it was like really incredibly emotional. And, you know, that's as, you know, an older man, not something you see a lot. And mm -hmm. so surrounding myself with people that I trusted was, you know, a huge piece and ensuring my environment was full of self care, you know, goes kind of mm -hmm. to that second part of it. And, and it's, you know, just for me, that self, it's different, whatever it is, self care for people. Some people it's, you know, they want to have the squeezable lemon. I use that a lot, you know? Uh, so, you know, cause you always feel like you're, you know, at least for me, when I have a lemon and I'm squeezing it, I'm like, it, rather than a rubber ball, I'm like making progress, you know? And uh -huh. so I'm actually doing something. And so during those sessions of creation and, and writing, I always had a lemon that I was squeezing and, uh, and, and, and just constantly allowing myself to know I'm making progress, I'm getting better, I'm healing, I'm writing about it, I'm feeling better. My yoga mentor, Shraddha Hilda Oropesa, came from out of town and, and you, know, you know, was there to do yoga with me during the making of the record. And then she would offer to help work with other people doing yoga or meditation who were making the record as well. So helping to create self-care for others who are involved in making the record because a lot of the themes could be very, very difficult, you know, emotionally for other people to deal with the, these topics of death and suicide. And, yeah. and what I don't want to do is cause somebody else to feel sad. Also, Lynn Robotham, who is my therapist, Dr. Lynn Robotham was amazing and came to a lot of the sessions and was just there to listen to me talk, but also to listen to all the rest of the band and the engineers, all of the other people who were there to support, because it was a very emotional time, not only for me, but they wanted to know how they could support me, but then how could Lynn or how could Shrada support the other people who were supporting me? You know, mm -hmm. that was a really big, of, of ensuring the self-care was, was there for not only me, but for other people so that we can have self-care so that when we go back to creating, we're going to feel excited about creating, you know, uh -huh. even, even if it's dark. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that's, that is really great. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think because, uh, I mean, well, you know, submarines have the best food and the hardest circumstances. Something like that. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> it makes a huge difference. Yep. I think. Yeah, it does. <laughs> For kind of wrapping things up and bringing things together, from your life experiences, what are the most important ideas that you want listeners to keep in, in their minds and their hearts from this podcast and, and from your album, from your work here, from Survival Tech? You are not alone. That is the first one. Uh, you, uh, 
there are other people who have had these similar experiences. You can talk about them. You are not alone. Um, There is hopefulness in communication because you will realize others feel the same that you do. So that is a big part of Western trauma and uh, being here today. You are not alone. Secondly, you can find your own survival tactics and maybe some of the things that you and I've talked about today will, will work for, for you to be a jump off point. You know, that that's so critical for, for me that somebody can take away, you can find your own survival tactics. I say it a lot, um, but you can choose love. You do not have to choose hate or darkness. You can choose love. You can choose light. You can see the light. Even in the darkest depths, you can see the light. And one of those four agreements that we talk about, about always doing your best, but I believe that if you try to live it every day, always do your best of all of the four agreements. If you just try to do that one, your heart is in the right place and that you're trying as what you can, that you're, it, it's not about yesterday and it's not about tomorrow. It's about living in today. Corbin, I just want to thank you and your team for this opportunity to have you answer these questions, to speak the truth that you've learned and lived and to share your lessons with the world here. And you can listen to Western Trauma, the instrumentals and the remixes on Spotify, iTunes, Amazon Music, and all streaming platforms. To learn about all of Corbin's work as a producer and a performer, you can go to corbinduali.com or bikiniwax.com. And I want to thank all of you for joining us for Wellness Musketeers. Tune in for upcoming episodes to gain the tools to improve your health, work, performance, and live a healthier, more complete life. Please subscribe, give us a five-star review, and share this recording with your family, friends, and colleagues. You can make a contribution through the link provided in our program notes to allow this podcast to grow. Please let us know what you need to learn to help you live your best life. Send your questions and ideas for future episodes to Dave Liss at David M. Liss at gmail.com. Feels like I need slow and down.